people, support is a key part of a career path at Red Hat. Fundamentally different, and across the board, we're always rated higher on, in service metrics uh, than proprietary software companies, and we should, we have to. The, uh, but, but more uh, fundamentally and more subtly around that, we add functionality I, uh, that customers need and want, right? Adding functionality for us is not a positive revenue event, right? When we added clustering or when we added virtualization 18 months ago, we didn't charge for it. If you're a subscriber, you can go download it if you want. If you don't want to, if you're not using clustering or virtualization or you're not changing out hardware or you don't need the new feature functionality of versions, keep running what you're running. We don't force you to upgrade. I guess technically after seven years, we do stop doing, at some point we stop doing uh, hardware enablement going way, way, way back. But in general, you can stay running what you're running or you can upgrade to the new functionality if you want. And the reason we, we do that is, again, we don't need to force people to upgrade. It's not a revenue event for us. At the same time, we have continuing motivation to add feature functionality to our software or otherwise you can stop paying us and keep using the software, right? So our model is wholly and totally built around adding functionality that our customers want and are willing to pay for rather than what we can force our customers into doing. It is vastly different and leads to a lower cost ultimately of, of ownership for customers and a lot less just churn in people's infrastructure. We have a lot of big banks running mission critical things on Red Hat Linux 2. You know, these are, and you know, as long as they're not changing the platform, why should they be forced to upgrade uh, beyond that? In addition, the economic model drives a, uh, a lack of lock-in that not only impacts what functionality we deliver, it also uh, impacts exactly how that functionality um, looks. And what I mean by that is tip a typical software company looks for control points, right? I've done consulting work for right? It's control point, how do I lock my customer and make sure they're coming back, right? And th that's fine, and you may love your software company, but part of putting in control points and making it hard to rip out and, and put software in makes the typical IP, uh, IT infrastructure highly, highly inflexible and a royal pain to pull anything out. And you know, I, I, when I ran Delta Airlines, we had a, actually an IT budget that was larger than Red Hat's revenues were last year. And you know, I saw my, on, my ongoing IT costs creeping up and up and up and up. And at the same time, I could go to the store and buy my kids a new laptop and it cost half of what it did three years ago. And you know, I feel like now that I'm in IT, I finally get the joke, right? IT infrastructure just gets harder and harder and harder because it gets more and more locked in, more and more proprietary, harder to pull things out. Well, one of the things about open source is fundamental in, in the development model. What we do is we ruthlessly commoditize, standardize, and modularize, right? Because we don't have a massive effort of 1,000 people centrally located developing software, things have to be modularized and standardized. So when we put out a layer, from a messaging layer to virtualization or anything else we do, it is ruthlessly modularized, standardized, and commoditized. And what that means is, typically on either side of that layer, we create choice in ease of, uh, of changing things out. I mean, let me take a very simple example, Linux. You know, when Linux first came out, our first major adopters were the investment banks in New York. And they bought it because it was much higher performance than the Unix alternatives they were replacing, right? It, they could get more transactions done per second in bank trading platforms, that, that's a big deal. But what they found out is after they bought it, I gotta say these were, so this is a different day and age in financial services, they could have cared less about cost. They were buying it for performance. But what they found is all of a sudden, their hardware costs dropped through the floor. Why? Because you've now, your application is no longer tied to the platform that you run it on. So before, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know, if you had your platform on Solaris and it came time to upgrade your box or replace the, the, the underlying hardware box, you kind of have to buy a, Solar, uh, a Sun box because that's all Solaris runs on. Well, it's hard to go in and negotiate when you either have to spend millions of dollars to change your application or pay up to buy a box. Red Hat Enterprise Linux at the time ran on any x86 server. It now runs from an Intel Atom processor and a mobile phone 
all the way up to a Z-series mainframe. So fundamentally, we provide choice, and the biggest cost savings with the initial Linux installations was to be able to go from proprietary risk hardware to bidding commodity x86 hardware off of each other, right? And so many of our initial customers say, thank you very much, you know, whether, looking at your cost versus, you know, the, your uh, subscription cost versus a license cost at the same layer is irrelevant. That's not where I get my savings. I get my savings uh, by creating choice on either side. Another example, um, Red Hat's uh, application server, JBoss uh, application server, is absolutely pure to the JEE standard, right? This is both good and bad for us. JBoss, uh, according to analysts' surveys, is about 30% of all application server instances out there, 30%. Unfortunately, most of those are unpaid. These are people who uh, have downloaded and use it in development and test, but when it, it comes time to put it in production, they'll often put it in production because they have an enterprise license agreement with you know, WebLogic WebSphere. Well, the reason it's so easy to do that is we're pure to the standard, right? We didn't put any hooks in there to make it proprietary. If it runs on JBoss, it will run on anything else that's pure to the standard. Now, again, for us long term, we're seeing a lot of customers are understanding the benefits of that and are now moving into production on JBoss, and we're having tremendous growth in the middleware portfolio. But fundamentally, by being pure to the standard, forget the cost of WebLogic versus JBoss. I mean, it's dramatically lower, obviously, it's open source on JBoss, but the fundamental ability to be able to rip and replace and move things around is dramatically outweighs any actual savings associated with um, the license fees versus the subscription costs. So by obliterating lock-in, we fundamentally develop software that is more flexible and more modular and makes IT infrastructures more agile. So for Red Hat, we basically look for layers in architecture that are broad horizontal eight, uh, layers that one should feel risk about being monopolized uh, and locked in. So virtualization, the operating system, high-speed messaging, uh, the application platform, these broad horizontal layers, by making them open source and, again, ruthlessly commoditizing, standardizing, modularizing, we not only save our customers money with dramatically lower costs for that piece of software, we make IT infrastructures much, much, much more agile. You, know, you hear a lot about cloud these days, and almost anything you'll read about cloud says clouds will run Linux. Well, I'd like to beat my chest and say that's because Linux is so great, and I think that's true. But also, I think it's a, it's a general acknowledgement that anyone building a new infrastructure it just makes sense to build that on open standards, open platforms, because why get yourself into another position where you have a commodity player that is, uh, or a uh, proprietary player that three years from now or six years from now, when your license agreement comes back up and you're locked in, can say, yeah, I think I'm going to double my prices. You know, again, not to beat up on competitors, but I will anyway. Uh, Oracle, in June, as we're going into a downturn, Oracle raised their prices 20%. Now, how can you do that unless you're so locked in and so confident that your customers can't do anything? Again, I don't, as far as I know, we've never taken a price increase because that's not what we do. We commoditize, standardize, ruthlessly take costs out of infrastructure and continue to move on to the next thing. You know, a lot of people talk about commoditization is bad. We look at commodi commoditization as a fundamental good. Now, again, we have a production system around open source that allows us to do that and do that profitably. But that's what we do. We commoditize, we standardize, uh, we modularize, and fundamentally take costs uh, out of IT infrastructure. So that's the benefit for the customer, but it frankly doesn't really even in there. It leads to a better, we call it software society. By sharing, by opening up, by making knowledge free by opening up and, and, get, and forcing people to share, we help develop minds, we help develop, develop organizations, we help develop society. When we do well as a company, we do good in the communities uh, in which we work, right? When we talk about sharing, uh, we're not talking about teaching you how to use an Excel macro. We in the countries where we do business, we are moving true computer science 
We have people in countries and areas you just can't believe who are customers.